Rachel, the, the book is so fantastic for me because as I was saying to you at the beginning of the hour, I was a student at the time, this thing was happening, but what was really clearly happening was that the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, was also besieged with an investigation that looked like it was closing in on the president of the United States. So none of us had our eye on the vice president of the United States. And I, I, my vague memory of it is when suddenly we discover uh, the vice president of the United States is pleading guilty to federal crimes, it, it was suddenly the moment. That's kind of the first we almost the first we knew about it. Yes. Well, and it was it's not only one of these stories, Lawrence, that got sort of overshadowed in history because of the thing it happened near to in uh, in terms of other events overtaking it. It was forgotten almost immediately in the moment because the events that overtook it ended up sort of occluding it. Even people who think they know the Agnew story think that it must have been somehow Watergate adjacent. Maybe it was some scandal that had something to do with some piece of Watergate. All those other Nixon people got in trouble for stuff like that. Maybe that was it. Some other people think it was just about something that Agnew might have done in his previous life that had nothing to do with his vice presidency. Like, we really did forget all of it. But it turns out he's the only vice president to have ever been run out of office on a rail. And before Donald Trump... He's the last time and the only major time that line prosecutors have ever contended with what to do about somebody in the White House having been found to have committed felonies. I mean, he was individual one before individual one. And so much of the legal framework by which Trump's crimes or alleged crimes are had to be considered by the special counsel, by this Justice Department. All that groundwork was laid by this forgotten story of of Agnew taking bags of cash in his White House office. He he was uh, he he suddenly emerged on the national scene when Richard Nixon chose him in 1968 as a running mate. None of us had any idea who the guy was. We didn't know how to say the name. Uh, you can go back and find the video of the comedians on TV uh, doing things with the name in the first couple of weeks because no one playing games about how you couldn't say it. Uh, and so he was this very unlikely uh, guy to emerge. Nixon had arrived in the presidency with the name Tricky Dick. He was thought to be corrupt uh, by the Democratic side of our politics and everyone who voted against him. And so there was this pre-existing image for Richard Nixon that he ended up walking straight into. But there was no pre-existing image for Spiro Agnew. That's right. And one of the things that I found fascinating that I didn't know when I first started pursuing this story is that one of the key people who catapulted Spiro Agnew from obscurity in Maryland to vice president was Pat Buchanan, because our old friend Pat absolutely loved the way that Agnew um, played the racist card in in Maryland and the way that he um, abused his black constituents and the way that he played up um, uh, the, his, his abuse of them for the television cameras, the way he uh, was willing to essentially sort of do a mid-Atlantic version of what George Wallace was threatening to do in the 68 election to rob Nixon of his base in the Southern strategy. They picked Agnew because they thought he was provocatively and performatively racist enough that it could defend Nixon. Nixon's sort of racist right flank from what was otherwise going to be George Wallace de denying him the presidency. And Wallace did in 68, of course, win a bunch of deep South states. But the sort of mid-South states stayed with the Republicans, stayed with Nixon. And they really believed a large part of that was because of Agnew's appeal uh, to the hard right racist base.